philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles, recognize the angels that walk among us. I'm Robert Culp. The world around us is made up of particles, also known as molecules. Water, for example, is comprised of two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule giving water, the scientific label H2O. We can't see these molecules with the naked eye, so how do we know they're really there? They exist based on proven scientific theories, which we embrace. We see water, therefore we know a combination of molecules creates the water we see. Why can't we embrace miracles in the same manner? Some people have experienced miracles, yet many claim they don't exist. Do miracles happen in spite of our beliefs? Or because we believe in them? As you watch during the next hour, what do you conclude? Mysterious encounters with spirits, angelic messengers, heavenly interventions, all are unexplained phenomena. Some people call these miracles, events that defy all laws of nature and logic. Hello, I'm Bob Evans, producer. Welcome to Could It Be a Miracle? And I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer. Our research team has documented many cases where ordinary people find themselves in extraordinary circumstances. In the next hour, you will see some of these remarkable stories. When two young girls find themselves in a life-threatening situation, a spiritual presence steps in to help. A mother is awakened from her sleep and hears breaking glass. Is a burglar entering her home, or is she receiving a premonition of her son in harm's way? A child lost in a big city receives protection and guidance from angelic sources. Illness prevents a best friend from attending a wedding until a healing voice visits her. And a man picks up a mysterious hitchhiker who has an uncanny resemblance to his father, who died seven years earlier. But first, a young priest is rescued by an unusual bodyguard. Bob recently spoke with authors Brad Steiger and Sherry Hansen Steiger. Brad and Sherry have written such books as Angels Around the World and Angels Over Their Shoulders. Brad shared this story of a priest who discovered his own special connection to the angels when he sat down to talk to a convicted murderer. One of my favorite stories that has come to us uh, is one I heard uh, told many times by a man we call Father McGuire, but uh, a man who had served the cloth for many years. Yes, come in. Ah, uh, good evening, Sister Agnes Marie. Now, please sit down. I'm sorry to bother you, Father. I know you just got back from the hospital, but we received an urgent phone call. A dying man needs you to hear his confession. At the hospital? No, I have the directions. It's no one I know from the parish. The address is on the edge of town, almost in the country. I called around to see if I could get a ride for you, but no one's returned my calls. Then I'll walk. Now I've got a brisk pace. And the exercise will do me some good. But it's almost dark, Father. Let me call some other people to get a ride for you. I'll follow your direction, sister. I'll sit with the man and his family for as long as necessary. Then I'll get a ride back or I'll walk home. I'll be fine. There's no better way to get to know a town than to walk around its streets. 
When he was a young priest, he was sent to a tough mining town. And the word got out because he came from the big city of Chicago that he was actually a very wealthy priest and that he carried big wads of money around with him, which wasn't true, but it was just a rumor that got started. Yes, what is it? I'm Father McGuire. You called me to hear the confession of a dying man? Here? Not here. I'm not dying. I'm not Catholic. Well, I'm not anything. Scott, that's the right address, pal, but there's no one here that needs you. Um, could I borrow your phone uh, to check the directions with the church? Well, I don't have a phone. Back up the road about a half a mile. You can tell by the phone poles. No. Sorry to bother. Good night to you. Sure. Well, now we have to fast forward many, many years, nearly 30 years later, and he gets a call that there's a murder on death row that wants to make a confession to him. Father McGuire? Glad to meet you. I'll be your escort. I'm glad to meet you, Warden. Actually, I'm just an associate. I'm not the warden. But I can take you to death row when you're leaving. Thank you. I got this request, and, well, frankly, I'm confused. I tried to reach Father Taylor, the priest that ordinarily handles these situations, and he was unavailable. Why did you ask for me? Being executed in less than 24 hours. He told me I had a chance to see a preacher or a rabbi, so... That's why I sent for you. Uh, are you Catholic? Would you like me to hear your confession? No, I'm not Catholic. What good would it do for me to rattle off a list of the bad things I've done? It's a list. A rob. I never got caught. And I'd still be doing it now if I would have got caught. I figured it was time for me to get somebody who knew how to pray. That's why I sent for you. I'm sorry. Do I know you? Have we ever met? You were almost on my list, Father. Years ago. I was a teenager. You just come to town. I got a call to help a dying man. Found yourself out on an isolated road. Remember? That was 30 years ago. Um, I'd almost forgotten. I made the call. It was a setup. I was hiding. I was going to roll you and take your cash. I was a parish priest. I had maybe a few dollars. And the word was that you had lots of cash. Rich family in Chicago. I saw the way you were always handing out money to everybody else, and I figured I'd get some for myself. I didn't count on you having your friend with you. Friend? Well, if this is the time that I remember, I was walking, and I was alone. No. You had some big guy with you. No matter how I moved to get an angle, he always seemed to be looking straight at me. And then, just as he walked away, he pointed at me. And then he disappeared. I don't know what to say. That's when I figured you were out of my league. I mean, you had a guardian angel on your side. Look, I've always figured that most religious people are fakes. I mean, they're better thieves than I am. I don't know much about religion or heaven or God. 
but I do know that I need someone with connections to pray for me. And you got connections. I know. I've seen your angel. So will you pray for me? So it took him 30 years before he heard what could have happened, what would have happened that night, but for his guardian angel. And at this point in the story, Father McGuire would usually tap his pipe and he'd say, and to all of you, I hope that your guardian angel is as big and burly as mine is. So facing death, the killer sought forgiveness from the one religious man who he knew for sure was well connected because the killer had seen Father McGuire's guardian angel. It's too bad, having seen Father McGuire in the company of the angel, that the killer wasn't affected enough to change his own life. Our files indicate a consensus of experts agreeing that angels are messengers who reveal themselves with a purpose, but they do not interfere with our free will. The angel's appearance was enough to startle the killer and protect Father McGuire, but not enough to alter the life of the killer himself. After this break, a little boy lost receives help from heavenly sources. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our next case involves a child who imagines himself a bit more independent and capable than he really is. His resulting adventure places him in need of some angelic assistance. As a parent, I can tell you that even the most watchful of us can get busy with household chores. You look up one minute and the child is right there. You look up the next and the child is gone, off on some plot in a play world. Usually they're just in the next room, but it can make your heart stop for a moment. In our next story, I interview Kelsey Tyler, a leading author on The Miraculous. She wrote the book, It Must Have Been a Miracle, and told me this moving story of a lost little boy whose fate is interceded by angelic sources. is that they believe more easily. Um, they're, they're precious and they're um, small and they're unprotected and so they need their angels a little bit more maybe than adults do in some instances. But also they're more apt to believe. If they see an angel, if a person appears to them and says, I'm your angel, don't worry, I'll be fine, they believe that. They don't look and think, no, you know, like an adult would think. So I think they tend to see them more often I think they tend to uh, be helped more often, and when they relate a story that happened to them, it's very simple for them. It's not necessarily extraordinary, it's just factual. An angel helped me. Come on, Randy, kick it to me. All right, I quit. I'm going to take a walk. Mom! I'm on the phone. Mommy, I'm going to Grandma's house. I'm going to take a walk. Hang on. Randy, lunch is in 10 minutes. She was on the phone, and like a lot of moms do when they're on the phone, she sort of motioned for him to be quiet and, okay, have a nice walk. Randy, Dustin, what's lunchtime? Where's Randy? He left. Can you take a walk to Grandma's? Their, their grandmother lived about three miles away and there were several busy streets to cross and uh, the mother knew that even if he said, he didn't know the way there. I mean, he might have known which way to start, but he wouldn't have known how to get all the way to the grandma's house. And besides that, the traffic was horrendous between the two houses. Pete, 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 wake what? up, wake what? up. What it's it? Randy, I don't know where he is. Okay, okay, calm down. No, 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 I have searched everywhere. Call 911. I'll check with the neighbors. Yes, yes, I have lost my son. A police officer was dispatched, and the grandmother was called, and you know, the mom explained that the little boy Randy was walking toward her house and could be anywhere between the two houses. The police should find him soon. Oh, Pete, what are we gonna do? He's just a little boy. Angela, I'm here. Mom, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, everything's gonna be just fine. I just couldn't stand sitting around the house anymore. But if you're here, what if Randy comes to your house? It's all right. Millie's there. She said she'd call if there's any news. Oh, Mom, I've looked everywhere. 
Why don't we go look just one more time? I think it's a good idea. I'll wait here. We'll find him. We'll be all right. Please, God, keep my little boy safe. The mother drove frantically around the different streets that were nearby, and there were no, just, there was no sign of the little boy. came to help him. Thank you for keeping my little boy safe. Thank you so much for watching out for him. It seems he wanted to go to his grandmother's, and we were going to make certain he got there. Come on, Randy, let's get going. There are a lot of people worried about you. Those ladies were so nice. Yes, in fact, uh... Why don't you buckle him in? I'm gonna go thank them again. I'll be right back. It's not a sign of them. How strange. Randy. You know your mom and I love you. That's why we ask you not to wander away from home. And you know the rule about not talking to strangers. Those ladies weren't strangers, Mommy. Well, yes, I know that they were very nice because they helped you. And they weren't bad strangers. But you must remember our rules. You must stay away from strangers. But they said they were sent from heaven, Mommy. They were sent from heaven? They said they were from heaven, Mommy. Daddy, how did they get here? So, um spoken again right from the mouth of the child. It was an angel who helped him. Our experts have investigated many cases which involve children who've been rescued with the help of an angel. Very soon we will dedicate an entire episode to the special bond between children and angels. We'll review our favorite stories and discuss the subject with our experts. Watch for that special show. We realize that as this show airs, there are hundreds of missing children and caring, concerned parents across this country. We hope that all those children are under the watchful eyes of guardian angels. We certainly do. Coming up, a young girl hears a mysterious voice that provides a healing power. Stay tuned for more miracles. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? Bob, I think many of us can relate to our next story. It seems our lives come to a standstill whenever we get sick. Being stuck at home when you have an important place to be can be very frustrating. We've all managed to go to work or some social outing with a cold, afraid to miss a day or wanting to stay involved. You may have even pushed yourself with the flu to go out shopping or run an errand, things a doctor would advise against. But when the illness is sapping your strength and you're too weak or in too much pain to respond, then you have to wait for the illness to pass or accept the limitations. In our next story, a young woman promises her best friend to be at her wedding, but an illness prevents her from getting out of bed until she hears a spiritual voice. It was the morning of my sister-in-law's baby shower, and later on that afternoon and that evening was going to be uh, one of my best friend's weddings was taking place. And I was living in Manhattan at the time, and the, I had to go to Long Island to go to both of these events. And I had come down with this incredible flu. I had like all the symptoms, fever, headache, nausea. I was totally bedridden. 102. Oh, great, just great. Why do I have to get sick now? No. Oh, even my nose hurts. Okay. Come on, Sydney. You gotta get up and get dressed. Stacy's counting on your girlfriend. Oh, honey. 
You're not going to the wedding. You look awful. Ugh. Thanks, Bob. Can you just help me get dressed? Sydney, I know you and Stacy have been friends forever. <sighs> but you've got a nasty flu. Wow. <laughs> look at yourself, sweetheart. There's no way you can go. Would you like me to call the church and leave a message for her? No. I know she'd understand. But, Mom, I promised I'd be there for her. I know, I know. Look, honey, don't worry. Get some rest. I'll be sure to contact Stacy's mom. Okay? Not really. I knew it wasn't coming from inside of my head, and I knew it was nothing outside of me. There was no, nobody in the apartment and nobody, you know, around outside the window or anything. And I heard this very distinct voice. Hello? Lie down on the bed. <sighs> Maybe I'm sicker than I thought. Sydney, lie down on the bed. Now, don't move. Listen to me. I can heal you. You can? Don't move. Stay still. I took a shower, I got dressed, I went downstairs, and a cab pulled up right in front of my building. I didn't even have to, like, flag one down. This is, like, Manhattan. So how was the wedding? Oh, Stacy was so happy when she saw me. I, you know, I can't get over the amazing recovery. You know, Mom, I think I know what happened. Really? What? I think an angel knew how important this wedding was to me, and he healed me. I told them the whole story about how I was healed by what I believed to be some kind of a healing angel who spoke to me, and everyone believed the story. I imagine our viewers are wondering the same thing I am. Sydney's illness returned after the wedding, so does that still warrant a miracle? It's subjective, isn't it? If you are looking for a cure, then this story does not meet the requirement. We have miracle cases where an ailment disappears without a trace. But Sydney's brief recovery allowed her to attend the wedding. And there's the voice she heard just before her symptoms vanished, which indicates an intervention of some kind took place. As you consider the cases we present, keep in mind a key element our own researchers use. Is the person convinced a miracle occurred? Miracles are very personal events, and great allowance must be given to the voice of the person who experienced the moment firsthand. After the break, a mother's prayers protect her teenage son from imminent danger. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? In many of the cases we review for the show, the element which connects a person to a miraculous event is an element that could just as easily have been ignored and the miraculous moment missed. In our next story, the key element connecting a woman to a miracle could simply have been ignored. Michelle and her crew went to Chicago to visit with Joan Wester Anderson. 
whose latest work, Where Wonders Prevail, recently hit bookstores. Our next story is featured in her best-selling book, Where Miracles Happen. Sometimes prayers can be very powerful as a protective aid as well. Todd, slow down. The game doesn't start until 9 o'clock. Greg driving you to the stadium? There's cars in the shop, so we thought we'd just jump on the subway. The subway? Late at night? Should I be worried? Mom, I'm almost 18. Besides, driving with Greg is more of a threat. He's got a point there. Will the game run early? Should be over around 11.30. Don't wait up or anything. Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. Bye, Hmm. Pre-game show starts in about half an hour. Oh, and just what I was looking forward to. A nice romantic evening at home with my husband. No. Hmm. Honey, wake up. What? I heard something. It sounded like glass breaking. I think somebody might be trying to break in. Well, we have the security alarm. Maybe the security alarm's not working. Maybe we should call the police. Don't call them just yet. I'll have a look around. All right, I'm going to come with you. There's nothing in here either. Carolyn, are you sure you didn't dream it? I heard it as plain as day, Bill. It woke me up. Look at this, 12.30. Todd should have been home 30 minutes ago. The subways are unpredictable. Carolyn, don't worry. I hope he's okay. Well, I'm going back to bed. As she sat in the kitchen, she began to pray for him. She prayed and prayed. She put a ring of protection around him, sent angels to him. The more she prayed, the more urgently she felt she needed to pray. And uh, she looked at the clock. Uh, by the time she was finished praying, it was about one. And she felt kind of a release, and she went back to bed. Bill, there's somebody at the door. Sorry to wake you, ma'am. Todd, what happened to your arm? Don't get excited, Mom. I'm okay. What did he do? Lose his key? What's going on? Uh, your son had a little accident. Uh, I was patrolling the subway station when it happened. Greg and I were kind of fooling around while we waited for the train, and somehow I ended up putting my arm through a plate glass window. You what? Officer Seaver says I was pretty lucky. Yeah, the glass broke into big, heavy slabs. Should have sliced his arm right off. Uh, he walked away with just a few scratches. Oh, my God. I lost my house keys. Greg had to get home, so Officer Sears offered to drop me off. I'm so glad you're OK. Thanks, Officer. Yes, sir. I was worried about you. Yeah, it's been a long night for this guy. I'll let you folks get back to bed. Thanks, Officer. You're welcome. Officer, wait. Yes, ma'am. About what time did all of this happen? Uh, I took the report. Exactly 1 a.m. Okay, thanks. Good night. Good night. She had sent those prayers ahead to be with him at the time of his accident so that he would not be hurt. Of course, she had no idea that that's what was going to happen. She only felt compelled to pray, and she did pray. Um, sometimes that type of prayer is called intercessory prayer, where you're praying for someone and you don't know why. You're called upon to simply pray, and so you do. And you're not exactly sure what it is you're praying for other than the person themselves. It's only later that possibly um, an event is revealed to you and you realize that it, at that exact moment was the moment when you were praying. I see what you mean about the key element connecting the dream to the miracle easily being ignored. If you wake up to a sound and discover no real basis for alarm, the tendency would be to roll over and go back to sleep. Again, timing played a key role in changing the course of the sun's destiny. 
The sound of glass breaking was both a wake-up call and a forewarning. If the mother hadn't responded with her prayer, the night might have ended much differently. There's no doubt the mother and child were connected by a bond beyond logic. Coming up, a harmless game puts two young girls in danger, and a miracle is their only chance for survival. Stay tuned for more miracles. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? We have more stories of the miraculous to share with you. Earlier in the show, we had a file of a boy who wandered away from home and needed the assistance of angels. In this case, two little girls playing in their basement on a stormy day innocently placed themselves in grave danger. There's a great story someone told me for angel encounters. It's never gonna stop raining. I know. Then we're never gonna get to go outside. I know. And then the rain will flood everything. I know. Cheer up, you two. It's not gonna rain forever. I know. I'm making some brownies. Will that help? Why don't you two find something to do while they're in the oven? Like what? Oh, there's plenty to do. Just use your imagination. When it rained real hard once, my aunt's basement flooded. Really? I wonder if our basement floods. Let's look. Okay, we'll need some flashlights, just in case the power goes out. just looked at her and said, honey, your guardian angel opened the door for you. As Karen mentioned, this type of refrigerator with this particular lock is no longer manufactured. For the few that remain at homes, homeowners should be aware of the danger this poses, and the door should be removed as the refrigerator is retired from service. There's no explanation as to why the locked door opened. The girls, grown women today, are confident 
they were saved by the grace of an angel. Perhaps if we all viewed the world through the eyes of children, accepting all things as possible, we might appreciate the lucky breaks we get every day as miracles. In our next miracle story, a man picks up a familiar hitchhiker on a lonely road and gets a comforting glimpse of the next world. When we come back. Welcome back. There are differing schools of thought about the connection between angels and loved ones that have passed on. Can we become angels when we leave this world? Are angels a separate rank appointed by a divine power? Can a spirit of a loved one step back briefly to touch our lives, or is that vision the chameleon effect of an angel, appearing in a recognizable image to best give the message? Author Sophie Burnham offers her opinion and some religious and historical insight to the angelic world with angel letters and a book of angels. I recently visited with Sophie to discuss the role angels play in our lives. She told me this heartwarming story of a man whose memories of his beloved father take on a life of their own. I think that in my experience, the people that I've talked to who have lost a loved one, almost always they have some sense of the presence of that person after, after he's died or she's died. And it may not come as dramatically as the ghost in the doorway, the, but there will be a dream, perhaps, or a sense of the presence of the person. Oh, great. All right, thanks. Nice speech, Daryl. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Susan. You're man of the year now. But you know, you're working way too hard for what you can accomplish, Daryl. You're losing one account a day to the big companies. Actually, I'm gaining about three a day. <laughs> of course, I need to get some back from your boys. And I think those customers missed that personal response. Sell your company to us, Daryl. It would mean a lot of money for you. I don't think so, Susan. Still trying to hang on for the sake of your dad? Hey, he was a great guy. He gave me my first job in the business, but he's been dead, what, five years? The business has changed. If your dad were around, he'd tell you to sell your company to us where well, you can still make a profit. Actually, dad's been gone about seven years. Boy, do I miss him. But if you were here, I think you'd really listen to me and kind of let me sort things out on my own. And then he'd just smile and nod. Don't hang on to it just for the memory. I'll think it over, Susan. It's nice to see you. I believe that on this particular day, he was thinking about his father. But he was driving on uh, not the highways, but the twisty roads, the byways. And there was a hitchhiker looking for a ride. He passed the hitchhiker, he says in his story, and stopped the car and watched him approach in his rearview mirror. Dad? Awesome. The hitchhiker, who looked like his father, got in the car and he's looking at him all the time thinking, this man looks just like my father. He's dressed like my father would have dressed, and he has the same features. How far are you going? Not far. And really fascinated, this man reminds him so much of his father. So, uh, so are you headed to work? No, I'm visiting with my son. He needs me. Really? Uh, where is he? Not far at all. So where should I drop you? Right here will be fine. Here? We've only gone a couple miles. Unless your son is nearby. I'd say he's nearby. Wait. What's your name? Thanks for the ride. Please, take care of yourself. He 
he's really shaken by this, feeling that his father had visited him. Now, I don't know what to make of this story because I've never heard of a story where a spirit of the dead could take on a human physical body and shake hands with someone. I don't know what to make of the story. But there you are. That could, I suppose, be, if verified, a total miracle. <laughs> That's an inspirational story, Michelle. We've all lost loved ones and taken comfort in the hope that they're still with us in spirit. On that lonely road, Daryl received the affirmation that there really is another realm out there, that those we've lost are watching over us. You wonder if you'd behave the same way in the company of an angel. You can't help but second guess the people who relate these stories. In this case, why didn't he ask his father why all this was happening? People who experience these events tell the same story. During the actual event, they were at total peace. They thought of a thousand questions to ask later. It may be part of the power of these miraculous occurrences that as they take place, those questions can't be asked. Angels and guardian spirits appear to serve and don't need thanks, so they disappear fulfilled by having completed their mission. Leaving us with the questions. We hope the stories you've seen have inspired you to ask the question we ask in each of our shows. The question we'll examine again next week. Could it be a miracle? Different stories, different people, but each one has embraced a common experience. Did the miraculous events happen in spite of people's beliefs? Or did they occur because of people believing in them? Could it be a miracle?